Good day, viewers. We are glad to have you join us on a fresh package of health issues. This program, like you know, is designed by Night State Television to talk to you, our esteemed viewer, about your health because it is said that health is wealth. Welcome to the program. My name is Hadiza Mohammed. On today's edition of the program, we want to look at the conditions of cold and, of course, flu, which is common now due to the weather we are presently uh, experiencing in United States in particular. Our guest today is a consultant ENT surgeon. He is by name Dr. Sani Mohammed. Doctor, mm -hmm. you're welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for having me. Okay. Doctor, like um, you've heard from my introduction, we want to look at um, flu and, of course, cold, just like what we are experiencing in our present um, weather. What can you say as a way of introduction to be the meaning of cold and, of course, flu generally? All right, so, so thank you very much for that um, um, question. So cold and flu, uh, they're basically layman terms or English words that to note sort of two different conditions but might not be differentiated by most people. Um, so the words has been used interchangeably in English, flu to mean cold, but technically in medicine actually they are conditions that are caused by viruses and they have some subtle differences. The broader one is common cold, all right, which people call kata, and common cold is different from flu. Uh, because of what causes it. Common cold is called by viruses like coronavirus, rhinovirus, parainfluenza virus. But flu in particular is a little bit more severe and is caused by only influenza viruses. So that is the difference and it tends to be a little bit more severe and which we're going to see the differences. So the two actually have been known right, right from time immemorial and they tend to associate with seasonal variations, but we're going to see that there are some people that have this um, flu or cold in them almost all the time. We'll explain what that means and what conditions that happen. Uh, but generally, it's a self-limiting problem because they are caused by viruses in the initial state. And for somebody who is immunocompetent, which means somebody who has normal immune system, by four, five, maximum one week, this problem should go away. That's the duration. Yes. All right, um, Doctor, sorry, I'm going to cut you here. Viewers, like you've heard from Doctor's opening remark, he said this particular condi health condition is caused by um, virus. virus in the atmosphere, maybe. Yes. Also. Yeah. And now we are going to ask the doctor what seem to be the differences, because like you did uh, say in your introduction, it is just a thin line between cold, common cold and flu. Yeah. Now we want to tell our viewers what seem to be the differences between common cold and flu. So flu, as the name is, um, suggests, is caused by influenza virus. So that's why they shouldn't to flu, influenza virus. That is basically the only virus that causes um, um, flu. Uh, so, and in time of presentation, it tends to be more abrupt, start suddenly, and oftentimes tend to be severe. In fact, some part of the world, they tend to have epidemics or pandemics of the flu, especially in the Western world, in America in particular, the Europe, they tend to have even pandemics of this flu. And that's why when the coronavirus came, it's most of them, they even call it a normal pandemic flu of the common flu. Um, so it tends to affect usually a little bit um, general population. But the common cold, on the other hand, is broader. It can be caused by many viruses and tend to be present in most, almost all the year round, while flu has certain seasons. Um, like we said, flu is caused by influenza virus, but common cold is caused by coronavirus, para-influenza virus, um, Kosaki virus, and even sometimes secondary bacterial infection. So that may be the subtitle. And usually slower in onset. So it's one that should last usually up to a week. And oftentimes, common cold, when it comes, it usually leads to secondary bacterial infection. And so that's the one, if somebody has initially watery discharge, then it's become to become, it starts becoming thick and smells. So that is common with common. But in flu, it's usually more severe, and then it's clear water discharge. 
uh, intend to affect broader body in terms of headache, weakness, uh, loss of appetite, body pains. That is common now with flu. But in common cold, sometimes actually in some people it can be even unnoticed. You just feel malay for one, two days and then it goes because the viruses that cause it are not that very aggressive viruses. Okay. And so I um, want, for the sake of emphasis now, mm. to tell our viewers the duration, though you have been saying it, but we want to emphasize the duration of common cold and of course flu. How long does it So take? in terms of duration, no differences. Okay. Again, we're going to see, if time permits, that how this common cold or flu um, present depends on the immune system of the individual. So there are people who, who are normally people who are called immunocompetent, which means the immune system is fine, it's working well, while there are people that have a little bit compromised or at higher risk of getting this. So maybe let me mention them now. So normally everyone whose immune system is working well who gets in contact with these viruses because they are spread in the air, they are spread by droplets through sneezing cough from the person who has contracted them. By three to five days, averagely, it should be over highest one one week that's a normal situation but in, in the people who have at higher risk like children less than five years or particularly those less than two years elderly above 65 years people who have diabetes there's no control people who are on some treatment for cancer or people who have had renal transplants or people who have um, a severe asthma these are conditions that weigh the immune system down. So in them, you can predict. It might take two weeks, it might take a month, and for often time, you even have to treat. Like in the other normal person in the community, you may not even need to treat it in some conditions. Yes, I was going to ask because some people, like <laughs> some of even uh, my colleagues here behind the scenes, some, some of them will tell you, you don't even take drugs for common cold. Yes, actually we advise them not to take drugs. So, but, but look, at, but the reality is viruses don't have treatment as for medicine of today. Okay. What we do is symptomatic treatment. So if the common cold influenza bar enter the body, there are certain ways it presents. And it's, it's called self-limiting, which means whether you do something, you don't do anything, it will pass and go. But what we treat, take the treatment for is if you have headache or you have fever, you take prastamol. If you have headache, you think, seem to cool it down, body aches. But you cannot take any drug to say, okay, this, this common cold should last five days. Now you take the drug, it will stop in two days. No, there's nothing like that. So that's why actually what, you are, what people are taking is basically support to the body, symptomatic treatment. So oftentimes, if there's no headache, no discharge, no fever, no body pains, you don't need to take anything. So it's self-limiting. In a way, actually, it's trying to even boost your immune system because the more attack the uh, system has, the more the immune system tends to develop what's called antibodies, which are like um, soldiers and police of the, of, the, of, the, of the body. But then occasionally, especially in common cold, I would say it ends up with secondary bacterial infection. What that means is that it creates a way for box bacteria to get in. So when bacteria come in, then you have to treat because most times somebody will start coughing and then chest pain, then you start bringing out sputum. So that can lead to pneumonia, that can lead to rhinitis. You know, so that condition then you need to treat. But technically, you don't need to treat, treat flu or common cold, okay. except specific ones like, you know, coronavirus. It's, it's a form of flu uh, you need to treat. Uh, doctor, if you I was come. going to come to okay. uh, as, uh, asking a question concerning COVID-19, mm -hmm. that is coronavirus, because uh, in most cases, the symptoms mm. uh, that present um, common cold, mm. flu, and COVID-19 mm. seem to be the same, mm. to the extent that some of our viewers opine that um, what uh, the uh, outside um, or the Western world tag as COVID-19 mm. is what we are used to in Africa. Mm. Is this true? So, so it may be true, it might not be true, but the idea is, like I said, viruses cause all this. And the nature of viral problem or viral infection is that it does not affect one thing in the body. So commonly, these viruses are contracted mostly through inhalation. So when they enter the nose, they cause what is called inflammation. So places swell up. So the nose, you start having blockage or some kind of stuffiness or discharge. Then it pass, goes to the throat, then you start having, then you start having blockage, then you start having itching in the throat, you start having pain in the throat. Then it goes down to the chest, then you start having cough, irritation, difficulty breathing. Then it touches the muscles, you start having body aches. It can even go to the brain, somebody start having headache. So the nature of viruses generally, they are they spread widely and they are non-specific. So in fact, COVID, flu, common flu, all the symptoms are the same. 
But what differentiates them is if you are able to do the test and know what causes it. And that's why actually before COVID-19, history know, we've known that what is causing COVID, and that's why they have to call it 19, because there are other, there are other similar conditions before. Yeah, it's so it's called severe acute respiratory syndrome of um, coronavirus. So we've had similar cases before. There's one, we have the MERS, we have um, SARS. So that's why they have to call this one um, COVID-19 because it's caused by coronavirus too. So they, they are basically the same. We know that this one, it's a little bit more pandemic. Some of them were restricted in Asia, so they like the mass, and then the Middle East, you know, was a little bit, but this was more pandemic, but the presentation is all the same. The, what differentiates them is when you isolate the cause. And that's why we in medicine, we don't have one size fit all thing. Two people could have the same problem, but caused by different thing. And what you give this person might be different from what you give from you. They depend on what is causing the issue. So we always want to, I individualized treatment. So somebody could have just common cold and he doesn't have corona, but somebody could have the same presentation but he has corona. So how you treat them is different. Because some people, like we say, like somebody who's undergoing cancer therapy or elderly, his immune system is weak. Just common cold can make it look like COVID. Yeah. Okay. Um, that uh, depends on the body system. Viewers, um, we are going to take a short break after which the program continues because our doctor is very, uh, still very much available in the studio. We're going to take a short break. Do stay with us. is still health issues on IDC television with me Hadiza Muhammad. Today we are discussing common cold and flu with Dr. Sani Muhammad who is a consultant ENT soldier. He has been able to do justice to the pro uh, topic so far in the first segment of the program. Now we are going to continue with uh, our conversation with the doctor. Well seated Dr. Sani. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, in continuation of what you have uh, started uh, enlightening the public about, um, you said the symptoms in COVID, common, flu, uh, common cold, and of course flu are similar, but now depends on individual body system and of course some medical conditions that could hamper the uh, effectiveness of uh, body immune Response. system. Yeah. Um, Okay, now what are some of the symptoms of common cold apart from what we know? Medically, what more do you people observe to know that this is a common cold, this could be flu, or this is COVID-19? All right, so like I said, the presentation is sort of almost similar, um, but generally straightforward cold or flu most people will present with certain things. So I would divide um, the presentation into two parts. History, what people complain, and examine what we check, right? So commonly, the history, somebody will come and say, yes, having fever, is feeling malay, which means just weakness, is feeling unwell, no, really non-specific complaints, just poor appetite, there may be um, headaches, there may be body aches, and some people even can have vomiting, you know, and then difficulty breathing, especially if it's pointing um, towards um, COVID. So these are the 
common presentation, but also some people can present with already sequelae of the issue. Like I said, if somebody presents uh, one week after starting of common cold, but then there is secondary bacterial infection, and that time they will tell you that the discharge is becoming um, yellowish or, or is coming thicker and it's foul smelling, it's coughing, and when he coughs, he brings out sputum. These are additional um, symptoms that are actually signs of progression of the common cold, not strictly the common cold. And there are people who may have background reason to have common cold more frequent. Just like people that have allergy. And in them, they will tell you that they have itching of the nose, itching of the ears. In fact, some of them you find that when they start scratching, you know, as if they're going to fall, and they start um, doing hawking. And then some of them, you'll be sneezing a lot. So that is additional complaint. But common cold can give this, but people who have allergy have more freedom of this. Then the second part is one we check. Most times you're going to find the eyes are red, you know, especially when they scratch a lot, they become reddish, they may be tearing, you know, and that's what we call allergic shyness. You know, just below the eye, you can find some uh, dark. dark. Yes, and because so oftentimes some people keep um, scratching like this, so we call it allergic salute, but behind you see there's some small crease on the nose, or behind, um, just below the eyes, you find a dark coloration. When you check the mouth, you might find that it's a little bit reddish, and those are the people that will have complaint of sore throat when they swallow. You no, know, they tend to have pain swallowing, or they even have pain that goes to the ear, and then they have um, fever. Okay, viewers, we are going to find out from a consultant doctor or um, surgeon uh, about the. We have asked about the signs and symptoms. Now we are going to look at the causes. What are some of the causes of common cold and flu? So common cold is caused by virus and particularly you say common cold is caused by a combination of either Kosaki virus, parainfluenza virus or rhinoviruses. Those are generally broadly speaking the one that cause common cold. While flu is single-handedly caused by influenza virus. So even though we have type A, type B, but those are not too significant clinically. Um, then of course the other um, sister to these viruses is the coronavirus, okay, so which is also is a form of the respiratory viruses. But how do we know the cause is basically by going to the lab. Clinically it's difficult to differentiate, but you need to take a sample and go to the lab. Okay, but often time if you are treating common cold, the cause is really immaterial because the treatment is basically supportive. Except when the things is the way the presentation is getting out of hand, then you now have to think outside the box and probably start um, the proper treatment, which we'll see when we come to treatment. Okay. <coughs> um, so before we talk about the treatment, doctor, we want to find out, since uh, from what you have said, uh, common uh, cold and of course flu are res uh, respiratory uh, illnesses. illnesses or infections. Are they life-threatening? Good question. This is really wonderful. Um, Straightforward common cold isn't life threatening, but flu can be. Okay, remember we listed a number of people or group that are a little bit at high risk or they don't tolerate the viruses very well. To reiterate, there are children, pregnant women, elderly people above 65 years of age, people who are being managed or suffering from cancer, people who have very uncontrolled diabetics, asthma, and hypertension. These are people who are at extreme risk of them having a little bit what we call fulminant cause. So what fulminant means that something that um, should last just one, two days, theirs might take five days, but these five days are actually very severe. So some of them can even develop problem, difficulty breathing. And that's why these viruses have found um, to be in the group called severe acute respiratory syndrome. So from common cold, from flu, can end up into the severe acute respiratory syndrome. Depends on this. As but more all, advanced. Yes, more advanced state. But all things being equal, in somebody who is immunocompetent, normal individual, they are not life threatening. Okay. Okay. Now, what are the preventive measures for this uh, particular medical conditions? Because, uh, like we know, prevention is far better and, of course, cheaper. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Because we actually medicine too, we feel prevention is always better and cheaper actually. Uh, so, so, but before we talk about the prevention, how do they spread? It's when you know what is causing it, you know how this gets spread, then they yes. know how to prevent. Uh -huh. Generally, these are uh, viruses that are spread in the form of droplets within about six feet from the individual that's contracting the disease. So, 
Generally, they are transmitted from one person to another and from animals to people. We know, like avian flu, you know, it's gotten from chickens and then they are from dogs and then from swine flu from pigs. So that can be transferred from animal to human, from human to animal and vice versa. And that, that case is called zoonotic. But generally from people is, is transmitted by sneezing, coughing, or rarely when somebody sneezes or coughs on a, on, on a surface and somebody touches the surface. But that becomes conti contagious if you touch the nose or the mouth or some part of the body by touching those contaminated surfaces. Having said that, sometimes it's not strictly this. Sometimes it's by um, having a compromised immune system. So when somebody has a compromised immune system, the viruses that is supposed to be a friend now become a threat. So oftentimes these viruses are there in our body, they don't cause harm, but because of certain conditions that were immunocompromised or stress that weighs the immune system, then they become harmful. So how do you prevent? So generally, for somebody who is proven to have, and how do you know who is proven to have? Somebody who is clinically having these symptoms, somebody who is sneezing actively, somebody who is coughing, somebody who has fever. But let me, let me take a step back that these viruses can be spread even before you have the symptoms. So we have what is called prodroma state. So actually somebody who has common cold or flu can have the virus and spread two days before he starts having sneezing. Before his own yes. symptoms Be begin before to own manifest. Symptoms begins to manifest. And this is what made COVID actually a little bit, a little bit difficult thing to pro. Because before the, the incubation state, before it presents in somebody, the viruses in the system can spread to other people. So likewise cold and flu one to two days before you have the symptoms and up to five days after you have the symptoms one can still spread so for technically it's easier to prevent when you see the person who is already showing the symptoms and what do we do uh, distance okay social distances like they say in COVID, mm -hmm. and then good hygiene if somebody's going to sneeze should sneeze on a handkerchief or his hand or under the armpit like it's commonly done now and somebody should maintain a good hygiene, washing their hand thoroughly as much as possible. So those are basically a normal, basic uh, preventive measures, good hygiene. That should, that should suffice. Mm. Then all our preventive measures depend on what somebody has. Okay, like somebody, if somebody is a confirmed COVID, then of course you know there are special measures that can be taken in terms of associating the person at home, at working place, or even isolation, or even going to quarantining, or even treatment. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, um, for children under five, mm. because um, um, records or should I say research has shown that a lot of children suffer from this uh, particular condition because of maybe the weather, their dressing and the rest. And just like you have also um, mentioned issue of personal hygiene, yeah. and some people also mentioned the issue of environmental mm. hygiene. Mm. What do you have to add to this? So, children tend to have higher incidence or prevalence of this because of unique nature of one, their immune system is still developing. So we have what is called B and T immune system. Their immune system is still evolving, so that is one. Secondly, um, because the envir our environment is a little bit um, quite polluted, especially in this part of the world, so their immune system tends to put them at risk. Three, they are always in custody or in contact with adults who spread this disease to them. And fourth, they are not able to maintain good hygiene contact, actually. Children are more likely to take things from the ground and then put in the mouth. They are more likely to scratch the noses. But the most important reason, which hopefully if we have time, is what makes children predisposed to this more is allergy. So allergy is the system that is fighting something that is perceived as being harmful and foreign. So commonly you find that sometimes when you spray insecticides, or perfume, somebody starts sneezing. Yeah. It's common in children. Some of them outgrow it, but because their immune system is just developing, they have not developed immune, uh, immune in enough um, antibodies to fight it. In adults, they cope after some time, but it's common in children. So that kind of reaction from allergy, okay, it's going to it make them a little bit more predisposed to having these um, symptoms and common flu, and even complication of that, because it can now give them to earache, you know, um, then they can be going to have what's called adenoid, then they find some children because of the catarrh, they have to even open their mouth to breathe, or when they're sleeping, they snow heavily, you know, so those are problems that are quite unique to children. Uh, doctor, please, what are some of the medications for uh, common cold and flu? Yeah. So, so generally we are saying this just for, like you said, education purposes. People have the right to know. We want 
an enlightened public, yes, actually. Yes. And why they need to know this is that so that there's some what is called a first aid. It could happen in the house yeah. or somewhere very far from the hospital or somewhere where there's actually no even means yeah. to get to the hospital or during lockdown, for example, yeah. when you can actually go. Or the hospital is even hotter than the house. So people should know. But generally, we expect that when people have access, when they have any problem, they should go to the hospital, let them be diagnosed, and then be advised appropriately. But in terms of treating common cold and flu, there's no specific treatment actually. So what we do is more supportive treatment. So somebody has fever, we give something for the fever. Somebody has headache, we give them for the headache. Somebody has discharge from the nose, we take care of that. Somebody has cough. Usually three to five days, this thing should go. But when it persists beyond one week, getting to two weeks, then it becomes something else. So from common cold is a layman term, but we call it actually rhinitis. So from rhinitis, it can spread from the nose to enter some spaces called sinuses. So we call it rhinosinusitis, which can be short or long term. Of course, if it turns to these forms, then they need proper treatment. So first, we need to do proper assessment and treat. Those are the ones that you have to do in some active treatment. Some, especially ad like advanced countries where they have the medication very available, they used to give antivirus because what causes the problem is virus. So they give antivirus. But here, antivirus are one are not common and very expensive. So usually you don't need to you don't need to give antivirus. But there, because it can be very fatal and it can even come as epidemics in the West, they do give antivirus for that's, the common cold and flu. No, not the treatment now. Okay, the we'll, treatment. Yes, we'll come to immunization. Immunization is a way of giving long lasting prevention. prevention and that is why most children are immunized for certain common um, illnesses okay so in where this flu is, has become pandemic like in the west actually they do vaccination for the whole populace i have I personally i i when i was there for about three years i had to receive this what they call a flu shot so before the season they give you a shot for like a vaccine just to give so that when even when you come in contact with the virus the colical connection will be very subtle and not life-threatening because for them there before covid this flu can claim life mm. so it can be very serious unlike us here but so there they can actually you can actually take the um, virus by some but the challenge is you can only give a vaccine to what you know so we have many viruses. So which one are you going to give? And these viruses have one ability of mutation. So you have, that's why we have parainfluenza type A, you have type B, type C, type B. Which one is causing? You need to go to the lab. We don't have money to keep isolating. So you don't know which one you're going to give, but vaccines are available. And that's why for COVID-19, since it has been isolated, there's a vaccine for it. Mm. So that's where it's available. But generally, treatment for common cold is symptomatic. When I say symptomatic, it's basically supportive. Sometimes you're not doing anything more than just uh, get warm water, um, do steam inhalation, mm, then that clears the nose, that clears the mouth. Occasionally somebody will need some, some treatment and sometimes somebody all you need is just good food, good um, hydration with water and that's yes. all. Yes, and like some people will, will advise that if you have cold, just go for pepper soup. So I, I, that's why I say good food. I don't yes. want to, I don't, I don't want <laughs> you to get... You don't want to be specific. <laughs> okay. yeah, so. yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Now before the curtains falls on today's edition of health issues, we want to uh, take the general um, advice from the consultant on this topic we have discussed today. All right, so generally um, this applies not only to common cold, but generally people should take their health very seriously. Ideally, people should be going for checkup. Um, common cold and flu, like you said, is not really a threat, but it can be a threat when there's underlying problem that somebody doesn't know. As a doctor working in hospital, I've seen people who will check and find their diabetic for the first time, they never know. Hmm. So you see, that's to me a little bit reckless. So people should volunteer to visit the hospital. And that's why during some of our, most times we do outreach program, we, give, we do free screening for many diseases. So people should be utilizing those opportunities. But whether that comes up or not, people should be able to have time to go and check their blood sugar, you know, blood pressure, Know, people should try to live um, a healthy life because we have been talking about viruses attacking the person's immunity and you go self-limiting but it make some uh, leave some life lasting consequences on some people those people are people that have comorbidities asthma diabetes so oftentimes even somebody has diabetes is good control it's not a problem but when somebody has diabetes doesn't know or somebody's asthmatic is not taking the right medication or somebody who has um, 
um, who is also on some treatment like steroid, especially ladies that tend to use some creams. Those creams have some steroid that they can even change the immune system or people that do the bleaching. So all these actually are factors that can modify the body response. So you find that ordinarily what your body should handle very well, now the body is not able to handle it just because you have weakened the system. So what I'm saying is that people should take and value their health. And that starts from one, prevention. Prevention starts from people taking good food, doing, trying to do some exercise, you no, know, um, forget about this um, our diet. We are trying to copy modern and um, diet that are basically junks. No, people should eat healthy. That way, if you have boosted immune system, you wouldn't need. But then for people who are at risk, like healthcare personnel, usually they should take the vaccines. Usually we, adv we advocate healthcare personnel to take the vaccine for some of these viruses because you will definitely going to com come into contact with these viruses. So like for me, ENT, that's why you find if you go to hospitals, ENT, they're always in face masks. Even before COVID, people tell, tell me now that the COVID is gone. I say, no, we've been using face masks before COVID. Why? Because I'm seeing people that have flu, people that have sinusitis. Sometimes you examine, they just cough on your face, they just sneeze. I can't turn here because I'm a doctor. So that protects me. So healthcare workers that are more at risk of these viruses, they are advised to take the vaccine. Okay? And especially in areas where a particular strain identified, the vaccines are available. But commonly, of course, the, the COVID vaccine is available and people should take it. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, doctor, for your time. Viewers, this is where we draw the curtains on today's edition of Health Issues. I hope you are informed and better enlightened that prevention is far better and of course cheaper than cure. Like the doctor has uh, rightly mentioned, he said eating right, going for um, routine medication or checkups, and of course daily exercise will go a long way to prevent this particular health condition. Until we come your way again next week with a fresh package of the program on behalf of the production crew, we are saying thank you to the doctor for sparing part of your busy schedule to be here in our studio. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Viewers, we'll see you again next week. Until then, I remain Hadiz and Muhammad saying bye for now. <laughs>